Hi, check out what I scored from the dumpster, the same dumpster that we scored all that gear with uh, the other month, that, all that uh, Schaffner stuff. And by the way, did get another Schaffner module. Awesome. This one's the uh, NSG203A line voltage variation simulator. It simulates like uh, dropouts and line uh, you know, uh, like brownouts and uh, stuff like that. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's got a weird-ass uh, output connector. So, yeah, not terrific. Anyway, just thought I'd show you that one. But, uh, yeah, might do that in a future video. But today we're going to take a look at this Tektronix TDS 540D 4-channel 500 meg, 2 gig sample per second, digital storage oscilloscope with DPO technology and the uh, this uh, series dates from the late 90s so it's uh, actually 98 I believe so it's like 20 um, over 20 years old now and these particular models aren't hugely popular on uh, eBay in fact a lot of them are faulty so I think uh, like <laughs> this particular series or uh, several of the very um, series of the old uh, TDS scopes um, yeah they might have a uh, a higher than normal uh, failure rate but anyway we can see that uh, the BNC is down there looking pretty good Nick when you uh, when you're getting a scope uh, second hand if you can get and if you're selling a scope second hand by the way always include good uh, close-up photos of the BNC and it's got all the active uh, probe attachments on there so it looks in pretty good nick apart from a couple of knobs that are gone ski but uh you know it's not a problem um a little bit of yellowing on the uh plastic and stuff like that but this is a you know it's a fairly powerful scope 500 meg bandwidth four channels two gig samples per second and that's enough for the 500 megahertz bandwidth just really the two gig samples per second but yeah this you know it's nothing to sneeze at but what are the odds of this working? Yeah, I didn't. I don't know. I did ten to one. <coughs> I'm here all week. Get it? Ten to one. Anyway, a floppy drive definitely uh, dates this thing, and it's apparently compatible with the iOmega zip drive. Hands up if you remember the iOmega zip drive um, for storing large amounts of data. We're talking about uh, up to eight meg of sample memory in this uh, thing, which doesn't sound like a, a you know huge amount by today's standards, but uh, back in the, you know twenty years ago, that was a massive amount of uh, sample memory. But yeah, a lot of people didn't like like the usability of these things, but then, you know, it, you wouldn't complain if you've got a working 500 meg four channel uh, scope with a decent sample rate and eight mega sample memory. You wouldn't kick it out of bed. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering why the video might look a bit funny, it's because I, I got rid of the um, other mixed uh, color temperature studio lights here. So I'm waiting to get, uh, I'm gonna have to get some new ones. So yeah, sorry, it just looks pretty crappy at the moment. Now these actually did in, come in uh, color screen models. I'm not sure. I don't think this one is. I think it's a monochrome one, but they came in uh, uh, color LCD shutter uh, technology. Warranty void if broken. That's okay. But the other uh, warranty void stickers look uh, busted. There's the serial number for those playing along at home. And it is a 240 volt model, of course. And we've got all the requisite uh, stuff. It's got, look at this, a VGA output. Nice. And of course your obligatory GPIB. And option 2M down here is apparently uh, the 2 meg memory, but on this particular model it's actually 8 meg I believe, and it's also supposed to have an internal hard drive as well. Okay, even though I've recently had uh, a lot of problems with <laughs> powering up old gear with the magic smoke release, I am going to power this thing up. Oh, let's go. Here we go. It's, yeah, I, where's the bloody power switch? Here we go. Fans are spinning, lights are on, nothing on the screen yet. I thought I heard a hard disk seek. Nah, no screen. Zippity doo da. Oh no, hang on. No, we do have something. Oh wow. Nah, the set. Nah, everything's collapsed. Look at that. That's see. Whoa. Oh, it's so. It, hey, it looks like it went through a self test. Yeah. Yeah. Look. Hang on. All, yeah, channel one, channel two, channel three. Those lights are coming on. So I so looks like the processor and everything working, but the screen, it's cactus. Just for good measure, we'll give it another 
cycle here and uh, see what happens. Yeah, I don't have a, like extensive experience with these. I use one of the more higher end, uh, the 700 uh, series model a bit, but uh, never really use the 500 series, I don't think. And I, I don't believe there's a lot of affinity for these. So, you know, it might be a good uh, one to try and uh, pick up, you know, like if you need a decent uh, bandwidth or something for uh, not much dollars. But yeah, anyway, the... The screen's gone, Ski. Yeah. But I reckon the processors are working because it seems to go through the motions. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's going through the trigger thing. We can select the different channels. So, yeah. Last calibrated in 2007. <laughs> yup. Okay, so we have a screen problem here. I have no idea what that is, but the good thing about uh, a unit like this is that it has an external monitor output. It's got a VGA monitor output. So let's switch it on with an external monitor hooked up and see what we get. Yeah, what's it gonna do? Because as I said, like those front panel controls are working. We're not getting anything yet. Hey, Tektronics TDS runtime environment, Java powered. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Java based oscilloscope. When did they stop that? Anyone? Yeah, there you go. It's, um, it's not color. It's monochrome, of course, because this is a, I believe this is a, this is a monochrome uh, model. And this is, yeah, I heard the relays click. It's doing stuff. 100K samples per second. And we're in like Flynn. <laughs> Look at that. There it is. Wow. Options 1F, HD, 2M, 90, copyright 91 to 98. On to power on self -test, test check passed. Push clear menu to proceed. Where's clear menu? <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Let's, uh, do, well, we probably should like hook up a test signal. See if we get something. Well, that's interesting. If I touch the probe like that bingo it's popping up yeah we're getting something that's going to be your 50 hertz so I could scale the horizontal for that yeah we're getting something i've got some horrible persistence um a dpoe type stuff happening there let me hook up the one kilohertz test signal winner winner chicken dinner you yeah, know let's hit the dpo button Turn that DPO rubbish off. There we go. Now we're faster updating. We're getting bugger all uh, <laughs> sample, uh, the bugger all memory though. It's the, what is it? The, uh, the the 2K of memory or whatever. But uh, there you go. Vectors, dots, intensified samples, infinite persistence is what we what we had some sort of. Uh, oh, there we go. It was set to half a second uh, variable persistence uh, before. So yep, I think that was what was turned on there. Oh, look, we can set color display here, um, it, but it, it, <laughs> it ain't color. It's just like a black and white, a grayscale thing. So the uh, amplitude looks right there. It's uh, supposed to be 100 millivolts uh, per division times 10 probe. And uh, it, 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 it's looking fine. I haven't compensated that probe on this scope, of course. That's why we see a bit of um, uh, overshoot there. But, but yeah, um, th that's working. Okay, just plugged it into channel two. I just ran the auto set. And, well, no. Nah. <laughs> and that's channel two. It works, it's not the uh, slowest beast. The, uh, the, like the user interface on this is a little bit clunky. Um, but you know, you, you get used to this sort of thing. So channel two is fine. Channel three trigger, there we go. Yeah, that looks good. Amplitude, no problems. Three channels working. Will number four work? Yep. Yep. We have a four channel scope. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Two gig samples a second. And if we go faster, we ET phone home. We're in equivalent. ET stands for uh, equivalent time sampling, of course. So it's doing, uh, it's requiring multiple acquisitions there to uh, get that. Let's adjust our trigger level there. Hey, beautiful. So this thing's working. A treat. No worries whatsoever. I have no doubt that if I put a uh, 500 megahertz signal into that, we'll get our uh, 3dB bandwidth. So we're back in our uh, DPO mode now. You can see the uh, noise on there. 
So let's go into our channel four. Oh, vertical menu. I can't press the channel four. I'm just, like, I'm used to like pressing like the channel four button and then double pressing channel four to turn it off, for example. And, but no, you've got to dedicate a waveform off button and then you've got to hit the vertical menu. So just pressing channel four doesn't bring up any of the channels, doesn't bring up the channel menu. You've got to actually press the vertical menu like that to actually <laughs> to bring it up. It, it's just a silly user interface, really is. So we can just knock the bandwidth down on that. There you go, 250 meg, 20 meg, 250, lower a bit more, and 20 meg will bring that down a treat because I've done a whole video on that. The wider the bandwidth, the greater the noise appears. You've got to love the uh, hard copy menu over here. <laughs> ThinkJet, Inkjet printer, DeskJet, high resolution LaserJet, Epson 9 and 24 pin dot matrix. <laughs> what else have we got? Uh, DPU, thermal DPU 411, don't know what that is. PCX, <laughs> paintbrush <laughs> format and TIFF, tagged image file format. Looks like that's by default or bitmap or uh, EPS. Nice. <laughs> Interleaf image object format. Interleaf. Huh? <laughs> and HBGL color plot. Beautiful. Yeah, it looks like we can uh, save them to the internal hard drive there as well. Neat. Now, I don't know these units offhand, but does the operating system for this actually run from the hard drive, or is it like embedded in uh, some non volatile memory on the board? Um, I, I, yeah, offhand, don't know. I think the hard drive is optional on this, so it's probably just for uh, storage, I suspect. Okay, let's go into the menu here, see if there's any uh, diagnostic uh, errors. Select all, tests, okay, uh, error log, here we go. 2000, 2007, storage error. Okay, so that'd be hard drive, excessive probe gain error, but come from, you know, there's some spurious thing when they had an active probe hooked on, something like that, perhaps. That's really quite good. Anyway, select tests all, and I'm going to execute all the tests. I'll disconnect the probe. Run. Huh? Oh, yeah, there it goes. Yep. Oh, oh, is it supposed to repower like that when you run the internal tests? Are there any other Java-based uh, test instruments out there, scopes and things? Is it going to reboot and run the tests? Well, yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. It uh, rebooted. I d nothing. So, one more time for the dummies, I guess. There it goes again. It just reboots. All right, so let's crack this thing open. See what's what. Oh, oh look at that. Beauty. We're in like Flynn. Oh, look at the big heat sinks on those um, massive ASICs. Wow. Well, at the design review meeting for this thing, they went, well, you know, look at all this, uh, all these heat sinks. That's going to need a lot of air. So, oh, bugger it. <laughs> Let's just install this thing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Look at the depth of that thing. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, that's just nuts. A 24 volt uh, smart fan made in Thailand. Wow! Uh, look at you know, and the huge big plastic guard over that to uh, to uh, like funnel air directly where it needs to come from. Wow! This is just one amazing beast. Look at all the hardware in this. It's all kind of what you know, tons of seven four series logic in this. But of course, lots of uh, custom ASICs and programmable logic and stuff like that. And the date codes on this are uh, nineteen ninety nine. So yep, almost twenty years old. But uh, yeah, the various option boards on this thing. This is obviously the uh, front end. Here's our front ends down here, and then we've got our uh, our four-channel acquisition. So we're going to have our uh, ADCs, and then our uh, sampling uh, controllers. Got our sample memory, of course. That's our base uh, sample memory. But there should be an expansion board somewhere. I do like how they've uh, look gone on both sides. Power supply in the middle like this, and they've jumped these jumper boards plus these ribbon cables. Not sure why they went for ribbon cables here and a jumper board up here. Not sure what the deal is. Um, yeah, it seems a bit strange. So it's kind of an unusual construction. This is obviously all of the uh, processing grunt. And I will put some uh, high-res photos on the EEV blog Flickr account. Yes, still use Flickr. Um, that's where I put all my photos, and I link them over on uh, eevblog.com as well. 
You see there's just a ton of stuff on here. Dallas classic Dallas semiconductor non-volatile uh, SRAM here. These have uh, included batteries. Once again, date code uh, 2000, 2000? 1999. <laughs> We're going to party like it's 1999. And uh, yeah, I'm sure the party's over for the batteries inside these things. They do famously last. Like they, I think they only had a guaranteed life of like 8 to 10 years. But they do typically last for uh, much longer than that. But yeah, this is like border almost 20, like 19 years old now. So it's almost practically 20 years old. It's it's really getting to the life of it. So yeah, unfortunately, the, uh, the non-volatile memory may not be uh, that great. We've got a, um, this switch down here is actually a non-volatile memory protection switch. So you can actually get through a hole in the side of the case and you can poke in there and actually activate this switch if you want to, uh, you know, I don't know, calibrate it or, or reset, factory reset it or do whatever. Bunch of uh, dip switches here. I think one of them does a test pattern according to the manual, which will uh, uh, try and use to, um, well, we could use if the, <laughs> if the damn CRT worked anyway. But uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, some unpopulated parts in there. Ooh. And... Looks like we've got some sort of little uh, post, um, you know, power on self-test, maybe error LED display or something like that. Check out this uh, footprint down here. Absolute classic uh, dual footprint in there. They went, well, if we can't get this uh, package part, then we can always get the one of the larger package part in there and substitute that in production. Uh, once again, some unpopulated parts in there. We've got three. Why don't we have a fourth one? Like, it's breaking the symmetry. Don't like that. Bad vibes. Then you've got these custom Tektronix parts, of course, and yeah, if the magic smoke escapes from those, well, yeah, good luck um, getting a new one. Would they still sell replacement? No, they wouldn't. Come on, no, you'd have to salvage a part, surely. So the front ends down here are inside this uh, nice nickel screened um, can down here. I really like that. This flat flex cable going off, that's going down to the active probe terminals on the front, and you can see that they're fused as well. So that would be the four fuses for the uh, four individual channels because you want to stop the idiot users from, you know, plugging in something that they shouldn't and you don't want to bring down your scope. So, yeah, no problems whatsoever. We can see some serpentine traces here. This is to match the uh, length, of course, for each channel because this um, scope is being a very, like, well, back in the day, was a very uh, expensive high-performance scope and it has specifications for, like, channel uh, channel to channel skew and uh, stuff like that. So it's highly spec. So I think it, I think it was in the order of, like, five picoseconds or no 50 picoseconds uh channel to channel skew or something like that and that's how they uh get it so there you go it looks like is that it's all going into this one chip i'm going to have to uh because we do have the uh service manual for this thing with the schematics i believe although it is the b model for the schematics instead of the d but and the IDT SRAMs up here, these are like very small. Um, <laughs> so these are the just the, what, eight kilobytes or whatever um, DPO, like like the fast memory designed for uh, fast updating. If you want your huge eight meg sample memory, <laughs> that's on your other board, bugger off. And we've got very comprehensive uh, trigger outputs here. Fantastic little uh, coaxes going up to the BNCs on the back panel and Lots of uh, good old National Semiconductor parts inside this thing, of course. The unfortunate thing is, all the uh, CRT driver stuff is all wedged in the middle of this thing. So, like, I, I can't even see any of it, let alone um, access it. So, yeah, what a pain. So to get to all that stuff, we have to get into this can right in here. That's just, ah, oh, it's horrid. Now, I was going to say that uh, one of the things you could have uh, done to this with a failed CRT, of course, you can try and uh, fix the uh, CRT driver, whatever's uh, gone wrong with that. But, of course, the scope works, the VGA output works. So I thought maybe, you know, if you wanted to, you could simply replace the CRT with a little, what is it, you know, 6-inch, 7-inch or whatever um, VGA uh, compatible monitor or something like that. But... But I'm not sure that's possible because this is all integrated down here in one huge big 
molded part of the chassis. Wow, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, you can't just like rip out that. And attention to detail, look at this little plastic uh, retainer clip they've put in here just to keep the uh, ribbon cable down. That's presumably for when you slide the uh, case on, uh, the ribbon cable flapping around in the breeze could get uh, caught and crushed and stuff like that. So that's just to keep it in place. It's actually very nice, but it's <laughs> rather annoying when you want to take it apart. Now the really interesting part about this is that it doesn't have any screws on this top board. As you can see here, it's held in place by these uh, plastic uh, clips, which then you see that there's a slot on the end of it. So when we actually pull this board out, uh, you'll notice that there's a riser board over here that it plugs into. I've disconnected all of the uh, various cables here, I think. So in theory, it should just, yeah, hang on. Oh. Whoa, that's a bit, <laughs> that's actually a bit loose. That's loosey goosey. That's just flapping around in the breeze there. But oh yeah, look, it just comes off like that. <laughs> so great. And that just comes forward and lifts out. Wow, I'm impressed by that. There's your hard drive. Uh, yep, that's your hard drive board. Cirrus Logic chipset down in there. And there is your main processor board. Nothing on the back. Except all bypassing. You'll notice all the uh, traces going vertical. Or, you know, they're predominantly vertical on the one side. And, of course, they'll be predominantly horizontal on the top side. Because this is a multi-layer board. Um, it, yeah, there's some stuff happening in between. But that's your traditional uh, top-bottom alternate routing. Sacrifice to the teardown gods. Wow, I'm actually becoming super impressed <laughs> with the construction of this thing. Very nice. Warning, danger, Will Robinson. Um, it looks like we're just going to be able to take some screws off the top here. It took me like less than a minute to whip out those boards. Didn't need any uh, screws at all to take them out. And I've got access to the internal high voltage stuff. Absolutely brilliant. The only downside of this, of course, is because you've got to take out all the ribbon cables and everything else, you can't access any of the stuff in here, any of the driving uh, stuff for the uh, CRT with the processor board running and the thing powered up. So, uh, yeah, you can't be, like, feeding data into it. If we can get into that... Ta-da! Ah, oh, beautiful! We're in! Oh, fantastic, I love this. Well, this looks pretty clean. There's not a huge amount of dust on there. You can see some down here. You know, there's some uh, collected on the grill over here where the fan has uh, come through. Haven't had a look at the uh, CRT part of that yet. But uh, this is, of course, the main switch mode power supply. Check out the uh, old school dip riser board controller board here for your <laughs> switch mode uh, controller. Yes, all the caps top quality. That's a Nippon Chemicon for those playing along at home. And we've got Nichicons down on the secondary side of that output, you know, the main DC output side. Nice little temperature sensor on the heatsink down in there. I'm liking that. Actually, I do believe it's possible to do the uh, CRT replacement with an LCD thing because the um, while the all the uh, like the outer molding for the CRT is all integrated into the chassis here uh, the CRT does actually screw and pull out you can see it in the uh, assembly diagrams in the manual screw and pull out from the thing so it's left with sure you've still got the uh, outer um, thing on here but there's no reason why if you had a suitable size LCD you couldn't sort of retrofit that in and and connect it into the VGA output. Now I've actually done a quick visual uh, inside the CRT here which is where of course the problem is uh, almost certainly uh, reside in. It wouldn't be on the uh, driver side and there's nothing really obvious from a visual standpoint except for the fact that the ribbon, the driver ribbon cable going over, I sort of like pushed that back in and it seemed to be out a little bit. So I'm not sure, I, I didn't really get a feel for how far it was out, but it was definitely out. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's a problem. I'm tempted just to put it back together quickly and, and see if that actually was the uh, problem, that somehow the ribbon cable, uh, the, like the tension 
somehow would like because it's it's not hard to pull that out it's not a large number away connector there's not a huge amount of friction force on those pins so maybe i don't know putting this in may have caused a marginal connection in there but anyway eh, it's nothing visual and no i don't see any dreaded uh reefer caps in here so not sure what uh brand those ones are so once again there's nothing in the power supply section i've had a a reasonable uh, visual on that like the 5 volts and the 12 volts and other you know negative 12 or 15 whatever for all that stuff for the analog and digital sections all working fine because all the channels are working fine and all the digital circuitry is working fine and the video processor and everything outputs fine it's just that the CRT doesn't work so most likely something wrong in there so one thing I'm not seeing on the power supply though and that's um, any convenient voltage test points i haven't uh, uh read the manual yet and seen uh, like the you know the service part of this for the uh, power supply to see like <laughs> where the uh where it recommends the voltage taps are or what rails it's just i don't know maybe i'm missing it but it doesn't really seem to be any indication that's that's a bit annoying I, of course, much prefer designs where you can just open them up and you don't need the service manual at all. And there's a test point. It says 5 volts. It says 12 volts plus minus 15 volts. And you just, not only are they little, you know, little turret test points or whatever, but they're labeled on the silk screen and everything else. So you know exactly what's what. Maybe I'm having a Stevie Wonder day, but I can't see it. And again, very small touches that I duly note these little um, like holders for the metal panel here on molded into the chassis. I mean, that's fantastic. Up on the CRT there too. So when you push this in and slide it backwards, it, it's held in place along there. Just oh, fantastic systems engineering. Look, they've even got the PCB supports molded in to the chassis. Unbelievable. And it took like a minute to put that back together. That's just unbelievable. I don't expect it to have fixed it, but I just wanted to try to see if it was that ribbon cable. I doubt it. I do believe we've got some sort of electrical or component fault on that CRT section. And nah, you can just see it incredibly faint. Nah, same issue. So let's actually just run the uh, display test on this thing. Um, apparently you've got to put uh, six and seven dip switches down here to open power it up and then go into the utilities menu and uh, you select instead of all that we were doing before you go down to display here and then we need to composite there you go that's what we want and then execute okay confirm test and bingo look at that ah thing of beauty fortunately we don't get that on the crt now the thing is this thing is color it has the ability to run color so, uh, whoa, we're getting a blue background there now. So that's like, that's really interesting. Wow. Anyway, I didn't want this to uh, turn into a repair video today. I just wanted to do a uh, quick teardown and uh, power up an analysis of this thing. And it seems to be a fully functional uh, 500 meg four channel scope. We're fully optioned up with the eight mega memory and everything else. As I said, still quite a powerful scope even today. So yeah, that's very nice. So even if you only had to use it with an external mod, it's a bit annoying because, you know, you've got to use all the uh, menu buttons and you, you know, they don't visually line up. Yeah, it's, it's still a winner by the looks of it. So let me know what you want me to do with this thing. You want me to uh, track down the fault in the CRT, try and repair that, or is it a good candidate for like some sort of, uh, you know, LCD replacement, modern LCD replacement or something like that. Um, Cause that'd be nice. Cause yeah, it'd be lighter weight, lower power, modern and reliable, all the rest of it. Um, and maybe you could, you know, turn down the fan a notch and stuff like that. So let me know what you want to do. And if you know of anyone, I haven't looked yet, but if you know of anyone who's uh, retrofitted uh, one of these with an LCD, let me know. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, you can discuss down below. Catch you next time. Hello.